Hey, good evening, everybody. This is Suspect Sky. Um, sorry if the audio is not as good as normal. I am actually in New Orleans tonight on business and don't have all my equipment with me uh, tonight. But just wanted to cover a, a really awesome story. So a few days ago, I think it was Thursday last week, Kepler Space Telescope possibly could have discovered an alien megastructure orbiting a distant star named KIC 8462852. What's so interesting about this is the Kepler telescope is used to detect variations in the brightness output of stars as well as a wobble effect of distant stars to identify exoplanets that might be in that remote solar system. Well this when they looked at this KIC 8462852 star system, they uncovered a really unusual variation and variability to the light that was involved, which led a lot of serious scientists to consider that perhaps there could be an alien megastructure. A lot of articles out here about this. You can see this one on, Gizmo on Gizmodo. And so they do discuss that there could be a couple natural explanations for this. Is it a cloud of dust? Well, that sounds like it's unlikely. It's too old uh, to have that planet forming disk. So here, this actually, this comet storm is actually the leading natural hypothesis. Eh, I don't know. I mean, so they have this planetary collision natural origin hypothesis and they have this storm of comets. They, I've also seen them called exocomets on a couple other articles. These are their leading natural origin hypothesis, and uh, both of those seem to be really unlikely because what are the chances that we would be looking at that star at the exact moment that one of these events would be happening? So while these are the best natural origin explanations they can come up with, it's pretty improbable that that's what is the true explanation. So because of this lack of a simple ex explanation, People have started to wonder, is it this Dyson Sphere phenomenon, uh, which is an alien megastructure? It has uh, some roots in the Kardashev scale, the type 1, 2, 3, uh, and sometimes 4 and 5 civilizations, which is a scale used to determine the sophistication and, by correlation, the, the age and the, uh, you know, where that civilization is on an evolutionary scale, one, two, three, four, five, um, by looking at the energy that that civilization is capable of harnessing. Uh, so a type one can harness the energy of an individual planet, a type two, an individual star, a type three, an entire galaxy. And then there are some updates and additions to that equation made by myself and others where a type four would be a civilization harnessing the energy of several galaxies, and a type five would be a civilization harnessing the energy of an entire universe. And this is actually, um, well, that was actually one of my talks uh, called the type five that I gave uh, at last weekend's, you know, just a few days ago's uh, Observing the Frontier Conference. It was a lot of fun. Uh, it was a really big success. It was, it was awesome to be there. Highly recommend you guys come to the next one. Just real quick, so here, here's one of my slides. Uh, you know, we are either not alone in the, or we are either alone in the universe, or we're not. Both are equally terrifying. Arthur C. Clarke, fast radio bursts. So, I fast radio bursts was my first talk at the conference. The type five was the second, and uh, it was a big success. It was a lot of fun. You definitely should come check it out sometime. Anyway, so back to this amazing find by the Kepler Space Telescope. So. Dyson Sphere, this is sort of an artist's conception of a, of a Dyson Sphere here. Here's another one. This uh, is actually um, a representation of a Dyson Sphere, sure, but Dyson Sphere has a couple subcategories to it as well. So the, the generic term Dyson Sphere was created a long time ago and since that time, the concept of a Dyson Sphere has evolved into often misused terms such as a Dyson Ring, 
a Dyson shell and a Dyson swarm. And I just kind of wanted to cover some of those real quick because they get misused a lot and their definitions actually become really important for the way that we look at how mainstream scientists are analyzing findings such as the Kepler's recent discovery around the star KIC. So this is just a quick star field map here. So this is the KIC star system. Just wanted to show that out there. And, and also really interesting too. So there's an alert notice by the American Association of Variable Star Observers where they are requesting amateur astronomers to provide uh, observations of the enigmatic variable object. And uh, so I just think this is pretty cool. So this, I actually didn't know they did this. So they are asking for amateur astronomers to help out in the study of this really weird variable star system. So if anybody has a telescope or if anybody's interested, you should definitely participate in this and provide some findings and, and help out with that real-time observation. Just wanted to show that out there. So the reason why the definitions of the subcategories of Dyson Sphere become important is I fell upon this article. It's a fairly recent one, actually, this year. So this article was a group of astronomers from Penn State began a universal survey of I think this study was 100, maybe a couple more than 100 galaxies. They did a follow-up study, which included 100,000 galaxies that we can see. And they were looking for type 3 civilizations. Like I said, those are the ones that can harness the energy of their entire galaxy, these super civilizations. So they went out, and they are looking for evidence of these types of civilizations. In a nutshell, they didn't find any. Uh, in a nutshell, they conclude here. Let me find it. Well, it's way at the bottom. Anyway, their conclusion is that a type 3 civilization is either extremely rare or non-existent in our local universe. And they reach this conclusion by conducting a survey of in this case, 100 or so galaxies in a follow-up study, about 100,000 galaxies. And they are looking for waste heat produced by these massive super civilizations. The assumption that I think needs to be questioned, so the conclusion they, are, they reach, I don't think can be necessarily deduced logically. So they say that because we didn't find the requisite waste heat in this sample set of 100,000 galaxies, these civilizations don't exist. Their idea is that type 2 and type, th type 2 civilizations will build structures like Dyson spheres to harness the energy of their entire star. And type 3 civilizations will build... Uh, what are called Dyson's Swarms. Dyson Swarms is just a cool way of saying a whole bunch of Dyson spheres surrounding the stars with, within their constituent galaxy. The idea is that the light then emanating from a candidate galaxy will be less than the heat that you can look at in the infrared band than what it should be. So a Dyson swarm, a type 3 civilization with a whole bunch of Dyson spheres throughout it, will have excess infrared heat being produced by their machines than the light from those con constituent stars that is being let out because they, these stars are contained in these spheres, so there's a lot of this heat coming out. You know, the heat is coming out hitting the interior of a Dyson sphere and then being output into space as waste heat, but we don't get to see the actual star because it's contained in this sphere. So this article then 
makes a couple assumptions and then concludes that type three civilizations don't exist or are extremely rare. But this is assuming that all Dyson spheres look like this, a truly all encompassing sphere. What the evidence of the Kepler telescope seems to be indicating, according to the variability, the really odd variability of the light being emanated from this star, is that the Dyson sphere here might look more like this, a series of rotating Dyson rings. So this is going to let out a lot more light than the traditional fully encapsulated sphere. So you're not going to have the same discrepancy between infrared heat and visible light that you're going to get in this situation. So I just wanted to point that out and why I think that this article in a sort of standard operating procedure, the way that mainstream scientists seem to reach really, really big conclusions and very definitive and absolute conclusions and perhaps people in our community, people like us, need to take a more deductive, more, dare I say, uh, legal, you know, analytical view about these conclusions that they're making. Because not only could it be a situation like this, but perhaps there's better recycling technology of waste heat. Uh, perhaps they use an energy that we don't understand. I mean, there's, there's just a whole bunch of assumptions being made by this article. And I just wanted to point it out because this has become a pretty cool story recently. So I just want to put it out there because this has you know, become a really neat story. And this paper recently published, um, I don't think carries as much weight because it seems like the empirical data is starting to look like this might be the style, this this set, this conglomeration of Dyson rings that perhaps spin and cause variability that we're seeing with the Kepler Space Telescope, which isn't really explainable by, you know, the exocomet planetary collision theories. It's kind of neat, you know, could be natural, but it's definitely one of the more exciting stories. I wanted to share that with you all. I also wanted to share the fact that I will be launching a new website called suspectsociety.org. This is going to be a distributed WordPress multi-site platform whereby I'm going to enable individuals who volunteer, so you can enter in your information here, send me a message. Uh, so volunteers are going to be given their own portion of this website where they will be an author so we're looking for authors and bloggers, uh, you know, site admins, people like that. We're looking for volunteers. Um, and this is going to be a way to create a consolidated search engine optimized platform for people to bring stories, different interpretations, different ideas to the forefront of the Internet media. As you know, Google ranking, Google search authority and ranking has a lot to do with how high your website ranks in authority by consolidating our voices and sharing in the tools and the skills that we all have. We're going to be able to have a more professional looking voice. We're going to be able to grant a voice to many people who normally wouldn't have one. And I would like to cover topics from interesting news in extraterrestrial phenomena, astronomy, space, all the way to politics and economy, and just trying to create a vehicle and a platform through which we can start to get more publicity whenever the mainstream outlets need to be questioned. And so I'm looking for volunteers. Love to hear from you all. Please just send me a message and uh, hopefully you know, we can find a way that, that you can help out and we can get you into this program. So anyway, that, that's all I got. Uh, again, Observing the Frontier was a great success. Covered a lot of really interesting topics. The speakers were really fascinating. I, I never even thought to look at the sun as being made from a liquid before. That was pretty cool. <laughs> um, those conference videos will be available for sale, uh, hopefully 
in a couple weeks, so I'll give you an update on that. Dissenting history continues really well. It's been a, it's been a crazy couple weeks with this conference, and now I'm traveling down in New, New Orleans um, and working on this platform. So I'm going to try to get dissenting history to you as, as soon as I can, but it is going well. And uh, yeah, definitely keep following this story. This is really fascinating. This this has just the right flavor of of accepted of, of like being accepted by mainstream scientists and 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 the media that it could possibly be a potential disclosure event. I hate saying that, but um, I've seen a lot of stories like this come out before, and this one has been the most publicized that I can remember. So it's it's a really interesting story, and definitely keep looking at it, and definitely look into some of these articles too. Um, you know, th this these are fascinating reads. These are available uh, at arxiv.org. Just do a search for this, and there's lots of other ones. These are really fascinating to read, and and when you read them, please keep in mind that while these are extremely intelligent people, they are really good at collecting data, but I would say that they're not the best at interpreting that data. And sometimes they jump to conclusions where they shouldn't and, you know, just apply, you know, out of the box thinking, apply analysis and and apply deduction and, and just see, you know, where are the holes in what they're saying and the conclusions that they're forming. Uh, mainstream science seems to do that quite a bit. Anyway, I uh, just want to give you a quick update. Sorry, I haven't released a feature length yet. Uh, I hope to do more videos sort of like this, these informal quick ones, whenever interesting stories come out and interesting updates come out. And uh, yeah, if you can, if you're an amateur astronomer, definitely participate in this. This is pretty neat. Um, so this is at the uh, aavso.org and uh, American Association of Variable Star Observers. So definitely check that out if you're an amateur astronomer. Anyway, this is uh, Suspect Sky signing off. This is just a quick little update. And uh, thank you very much for your time. Bye.